They are not financial products. They do not look anything like a financial product or security. And Gary Gensler just wants to chill innovation with this industry. And so again, because he doesn't want to use the taxpayer dollars right now, because he's had a lot of losses stack up in courts, he's just going to threaten enforcement actions through these Wells notices. He wants to chill innovation to make sure that that innovation can exist in the United States. This content is brought to you by Gemini, which is one of the top exchanges in the crypto market. I am a user of this platform and they make it easy for you to buy, sell and trade crypto. They offer a variety of great crypto products and services, such as a fully functional exchange and app. They offer staking. They have a great credit card and they have a USD backed stablecoin called Gemini dollar. They also offer a derivatives platform where you can easily do all types of crypto trading with perpetual contracts, and much more. Uh, if you sign up and you trade $100 in Bitcoin, you can get $10 in Bitcoin in return using the code WELCOME10. So if you'd like to learn more about Gemini, visit the link in the description. Welcome into the Thinking Crypto Podcast. I'm your host, Tony Edward, and with me today is Cody Carbone, who is the president at the Digital Chamber. Cody, great to see you. Great to see you, Tony. Always glad to be here. Cody, you know, I got to get your perspective and your insights on what the hell is going on uh, with crypto <laughs> in D.C. Let's start with the SEC versus NFTs. All of a sudden, yeah. Cody, they come out of the woodwork and say, OpenSea, here's a Wells notice. We think these NFTs on the blockchain are securities. I'm surprised by this, given all the political talk and things that have been unfolding over the past two to three months with Trump and Kamala Harris. What are your thoughts on this? It's funny. I feel like you could close your eyes and just point to any date on the calendar in the last three years under Gary Gensler's tenure, ten, uh, Gary Gensler's tenure, and say what the hell is going on with the <laughs> SEC as it uh, as it relates to crypto. Um, it, it's a shame. It, it really is sad. I mean, this is just another aggressive overreach by the SEC. This has been part of their playbook again for the last three years under Gensler's tenure, um, and now I I think. Hopefully, he's gone a step too far. We probably could have said that several times. I mean, he's got outstanding Wells notice to not just OpenSea now, but to Robinhood and, and Uniswap. And he is single-handedly regulating through enforcement actions or the threat of enforcement actions. That if he can't bring an enforcement action because it's expensive, it costs a lot of resources and taxpayer dollars, then why not threaten the enforcement action and stifle innovation. It's exactly what he's doing with OpenSea now. I think a lot of us can agree, and there was a whole congressional hearing on this where, if you haven't seen it, Congressman Richie Torres goes through, do you think this, a Pokemon card, is a security? Do you think a baseball card is a security? And we can all agree that most NFTs out there right now are not securities. They are not investment contracts. Now, they could be sold and packaged as security, sure, that's a different conversation than what we're having, though. But most of the things on the OpenSea platform, if not all of the things on the OpenSea platform are not securities. They look like digital co collectibles. A definition that we've been using at the Chamber is consumptive use NFTs. These NFTs are clearly not financial products. They are used and intended to be used from the issuer and from the consumer for consumption. They're intended to be used like baseball cards, like Pokemon, so they can collect and trade and hold and play with and hang up on their wall. They are not financial products. They do not look anything like a financial product or security. And Gary Gensler just wants to chill innovation with this industry. And so again, because he doesn't want to use the taxpayer dollars right now, because he's had a lot of losses stack up in courts, he's just going to threaten enforcement actions through these Wells notices. He wants to chill innovation to make sure that that innovation can exist in the United States it's pretty despicable. And the only way to really hold him accountable is these oversight hearings that are coming up, which I know we'll touch on in, in Congress, um, and then hopefully to be removed because th this is asinine at this point. So, Cody, you know, and maybe you could take us behind the scenes and I, you could probably feel a bit of my frustration here because, you know, we've been seeing a lot I'm right of, there with you. <laughs> I mean, we've been yeah. seeing a lot of movements from Democrats, uh, Ro Khanna with multiple round tables, the crypto for Harris movement at launch and uh, really great stuff. Right. And I'm wondering where is Kamala Harris and Joe Biden uh, in trying to at least get the SEC to pause? Like, OK, just stop. Let's let's figure this out. Um, 
Is there any movement there? But I, I want to be fair because I know Kamala Harris yeah. just took over and you know, doing campaigning and so forth. And there's a lot on her plate. I get it. But when is this going to stop? Or is this it's going to go up to the election and then people are going to have to make their, their decisions there? Unfortunately, I don't think it's going to stop. Mm. I, I think it's going to be as just as you said, it's going to go up to the election and really up into the next administration, whether it's a Harris or a Trump administration. But as long as Gary Gensler is in this position, and when Congress is not acting because there's limited time in the legislative calendar, things are really tightening up as we're, you know, almost two months from the election. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of legislation is going to pass. And if it is going to pass, it's must pass legislation. It's funding the government. It's the National Defense Authorization Act. It's all these other reauth bills. If legislation is not going to pass and Congress's sights are not set on the SEC, then the SEC feels emboldened to continue to act, especially if Gary Gensler thinks that his time and days may be numbered as sec chairman he wants to do everything he possibly can in this limited window and so what he's going to do is these enforcement actions there's not going to be a lot of rulemakings because that hasn't been his posture um throughout his tenure there um, and we're just going to see him continue to threaten this industry because he has been very clear that this is personal for him this is a vendetta for him he thinks this industry is full of fraudsters and scammers and so he'll act. And I, I don't see any change in position from the current administration to um, restrain him. I think if that were the case and they would have seen that this is politically unpopular, um, if not just wrong, um, that they would have done something by now or said something. Um, but they haven't done so. I mean, Biden has been very silent on the SEC's actions. And in fact, he sided with the SEC when he vetoed the resolution to nullify SAB 121. So I don't think we're going to see anything out of the Biden administration, because why would they change their position now? Mm -hmm. They've had years to change the position when they went after Coinbase, when they went after Kraken, um, after they were issuing the Wells notices to Robinhood and, and the likes, um, and they haven't changed. So to your point on the Harris campaign, I agree. I, I don't think this is top of her list right now in terms of priorities. Um, and to be fair to her, there's a lot of that list is growing and there's a lot of things she needs to tackle. Well, she has to come up with the whole policy platform in a very short amount of time. Uh, usually these campaigns take several years. Hers has been truncated into, unfortunately, have to be several months and weeks. And so I think, you know, as she's going through the motions, she's getting her staff together. She is really building the campaign infrastructure. Crypto obviously has been a hot topic and there's been a lot of pressure put on by the industry and just the broader markets in making sure that the campaign has a position on crypto. And I know she has surrounded herself with some people who have been pretty forward on crypto and have reached out to the industry. But I don't see this being a priority for her. I especially don't see her calling out the sitting SEC chair and ruffling feathers in the administration when she has to worry about winning an election. Um, I, I think it's just it's too messy for her to get involved in right now. And I think our best hope as it relates to a potential Harris presidency is that she comes in day one with new faces and says, hey, I'm going to nominate a new SEC chair. Gary Gensler, if you want to stay on because your tenure is not up until 2026, then you can be a commissioner. If you want to resign, so be it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, that's kind of disappointing, but I also understand, you know, the, the complexities of what's happening right now and, and the whole change. Um, but I, I, I'm hoping that at least, you know, we heard some, I think it was her top campaign advisor, said some positive things that she's ready to support, you know, legislation. Uh, I know Chuck Schumer at the uh, Crypto for Harris uh, live stream town hall, you know, said he's ready to push regulations through. So hearing some good things, but I want to see action. man. I'm, I, I'm with you. I'm trying to stay optimistic. Um, it has been great to see the, the Crypto for Harris coalition grow. It's been great to see Chuck Schumer say, I, I think she'll be supportive and all of her advisors like Brian Nelson and David Plouffe, who used to work for Binance, um, be outwardly supportive of the industry and say, hey, look, we're, we're working to embrace it. I'm optimistic based on the candidate, even though that she is a blank slate and has not said anything on crypto. My hope is that she's better than the current administration and that she comes from California. She has been aligned with big tech um, for many years and Silicon Valley has funded a lot of her campaigns. 
And so whether you like it or not, this industry has been grouped in Washington circles as big tech. And so my, I'm hopeful that she embraces the innovation. But with every day that passes, even though the crypto for Harris voice gets louder and louder and she can align herself with as many pro crypto people as possible and all of her supporters that are in Congress can say, no, she is pro crypto. Give her a chance. Every day that goes by that she doesn't say anything, I get a little, a little more fearful. Yeah. And um, you've got the candidate on the other side of the aisle who has been very loud and very supportive of the industry. And so my hope is that she has been, she becomes forced to take a position publicly, that there's a question at the debate or that the voices get so loud and the pressure gets so loud and that when she unveils her policy platform, I know she unveiled her economic platform and this wasn't in there, but you know, FinTech and innovation was in there. But as she starts to unveil more policies, that this has to be a policy that she comes out with, whether she's pro or neg- or you know, pro uh, for or against. I think we just want clarity at this point. We obviously want her to be supportive, but we also want to know where she sits. And right now, this this kind of unclear. Who knows? She's for. She's against. Is she aligned with the current administration? Is she going to be totally different? It's, it's causing a lot of um, internal strife and a little bit of chaos. And I'm looking forward to the day that she is forced to take a position. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Now, you mentioned earlier, um, Gary Gensler is going to be at a hearing coming up soon. Tell us about this hearing. I'm assuming crypto may come up and, and what's, what you're anticipating. I think crypto will be a big part of the hearings and it's hearings plural. So there will be two at the end of September. Um, Congress, as, as part of their function, has an oversight function over the SEC. Uh, two committees, one in the House, the House Financial Services Committee oversees the F- SEC, and in the Senate, the Senate Banking Committee oversees the SEC. As part of that oversight function, they have to hear from the chairman of the commission. And they can really call him up at any time, but they usually do it on an annual basis, and it's usually in September. These hearings haven't been officially noticed, but they're rumored to be the last week of September before they leave for October recess and go home and and finish the campaign season. September 24th in the House is what we're hearing and September 25th in the Senate. For Gary Gensler to sit there and have to answer questions as it relates to his digital asset policy. We've seen this again for, for many years now. I'm thinking crypto will be one of the top issues. There will be some other ones like the climate disclosure rule, consolidated auto trail. I'm sure there'll be some politics mixed in. But given all of the SEC's actions have been focused on crypto, that really this has been their bailiwick is crypto enforcement. There's going to have to be questions. I think we're going to see more bipartisan calls forever for the SEC to change its stance, more bipartisan criticism. Uh, of Gary Gensler's actions and his failure to work and collaborate with the industry to from, uh, to propose rulemakings that allow for industry feedback to really try to make this technology thrive or exist in the United States. I think we'll see a lot of that. We have seen some Democratic voices in the past call him out, the Richie Torres is the Wiley Nichols. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we will see more and I think we'll see them in the Senate as well, which we have, you know, those conversations have really been dominated by Elizabeth Warren in the past. Woody, as we get closer to the election and we're seeing Fair Shake, which raised an incredible amount of money, I think over 200 million. And I think crypto, if I'm not mistaken, is the biggest spender in this election cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, How is that resonating in D.C., given that, you know, you told me in 2023 this was going to be the case, that crypto would have this war chest, would be spending so much to support pro-crypto candidates and, of course, go against anti-crypto candidates. And uh, some of the Super Tuesday and primary results show a bit of that. Now, there's other factors. But what's happening in D.C. there? Are people recognizing, like, wait a minute, crypto spending this amount of money, that type of thing? It's an oh shit moment. For Washington, um, it is probably the biggest, the biggest legitimizing factor of this industry. Mm. For as much emphasis as we put on as the digital chamber um, on education, education on, on use cases and the value of this technology, um, political muscle and fundraising is what makes a difference in D.C., Now, advocacy is a huge part in us moving the needle in trying to get more champions because they understand the technology is where we've been to this point. Political muscle and fundraising is the next thing to give. And the fact that we are being compared to the American Bankers Association and the banking lobby and the real estate lobby 
Um, everyone in DC now is forced to take a position on crypto because they know their race can be impacted by it. And so while there's a lot of negative connotations with that, there are some positives with that, like that legitimizing factor. All of the naysayers and detractors will say, well, that just means, you know, crypto is buying elections, whatever. They're now paying attention to it. They're paying attention to it where for the past decade, it has been perceived by many in DC as a fad. That this is a fad that only a very small subset of the population cares about, that probably not many of my constituents care about. I don't need to pay attention whatsoever. Now, as they are looking at running, and the House is running every two years, and the Senate's every six years, every single campaign could be impacted by crypto because of that political muscle. And so they're going to be forced to take a position. And so that is massive for me. As big, again, as big as the use cases are, as big as the Bitcoin price going up is, as big as uh, you know the Bitcoin and ETH um, ETFs are, having political muscle through fundraising dollars really, really impacts campaigns, and it forces folks to take a position on it. Now, that position is going to be driven usually by the again the use cases, and that's where the advocacy and education comes in. But just the fact that the dollars can force them to take a position on it, that's huge. And so it's been a massive legitimizing factor for us. And that's why I think it really is the oh shit moment. This this industry is here to stay. So with that said, Cody, do you think we might get a surprise similar to what happened earlier in the year that we did not see 71 Democrats joining Republicans to get the fit 21 bill out of the house that maybe Cody, and I'm praying and I'm fingers crossed, right? Yeah. <laughs> that all of a sudden we get a surprise, something is going through the Senate, uh, some sort of crypto bill. It's not a zero chance, mm -hmm. but it is unlikely, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I, you know, I alluded to at the beginning of the of the conversation, there's not a lot of time left. Yeah. We have three weeks coming up in September uh, where Congress will be in DC ahead of the election. They're gone all of October. These three weeks in September, while there will be, you know, the SEC oversight hearings, they have to fund the government. The government funding shuts down September 30th. They've got a lot of must-pass bills. So you look at, you know, the Ag Committee, which is a huge role as it comes to market structure legislation, for example. Um, they need to pass a farm bill. Mm. And so there's a lot of competing priorities. And so when I look at FIT that passed in May, my hope was that there would be champions immediately that would take it up and say, okay, there's something we can do here. There's bipartisan interest. There's motivation. Let's move legislation. That has happened, but it's been fairly quiet, and there hasn't been that big coalition around it like there was around FIT. So you've got Senator Stabenow, who's got her Digital Commodities Act. She's trying to move that. If you remember, right before August recess, she canceled a markup on that because there wasn't bipartisan support. You had Senator J.D. Vance, who was trying to take fit and tweak it a little bit for his Republican-only effort. He became the vice presidential nominee. So that has moved to the back burner. You have Lummis Gillibrand. That legislation is still out there, but it's it's really big and comprehensive. It's more than market structure, SEC, CFTC. It's, it's tax. It's consumer protection. It's anti-money laundering. And so that's just a real behemoth to move right now. And then the other aspect of it is that let's say a bill does pass out of the Senate. And I'm just focused on market structure right now. It's likely not going to look like fit. It's likely going to be different because there has been no appetite from any Senate office to just take fit as passed, despite the amount of support it had in the House, and to move that. No one has done that to this point. And so if the Senate is going to move a bill, whether it's Stabena, Lummis, Gillibrand, or Vance, or something else, that means it'll have to go back to the House because it's not what the House voted on. And so you look at all of these, you know, hoops we have to jump through and say, wait, we're only here for, th I keep looking down at my calendar. We're only here for three more weeks this month. And then they're gone all of October. And then we get back and it's a lame duck because there'll be a new Congress coming in and there's a new president coming in, no matter what, um, and a new administration. It, it's really tough to find where crypto legislation moves. But I say, and this is where I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed like you are. I say a non-zero chance because there is interest in this and there are forces that are motivated. Um, and, and I'm talking broader now than market structure. You bring in stable coins, you bring in some of the other efforts that have been, you know, uh, legislation to nullify SAB 121. You have motivators um, who are retiring. So you have Patrick McHenry who's leaving, um, who is not affected at all by what happens in the election. 
who's not affected by the legislative calendar. He wants to move legislation on this because this is his legacy at this point. You have Debbie Stabenow in the Senate, who's leading a market structure bill, who's retiring. So you have these folks who are saying, yes, sure. While my colleagues may be impacted by the elections and they're running races, I'm focused on what's happening in DC. I'm focused on these bills that I've introduced and I want to move them. And those are powerful voices. And so if they're able to barter, if they're able to shake out some some kind of deal or attach, you know, some digital asset legislation to one of those must pass bills that we talked about, maybe, maybe something can get done. But right now, I think it's very, very difficult. And there's just so many hoops that um, that we'll have to jump through that it looks unlikely. Mm, that's great insight because there's just so much going on. And to your point, not a limited time. So maybe... 2025, Cody, that uh, we, we can see some movement. That's the hope. Things. That's the hope. I'm, I'm keeping my sights on 2025. Yeah. I think there is real chance. There's obviously bipartisan interest here. Um, my hope is that the more days go by and the more that members of Congress learn about this technology, you've got both at the top of the tickets in the presidential race, hopefully talking about this, maybe at one of the debates coming up. Um, that this becomes nonpartisan, and then it's just a no-brainer. We've seen what the SEC is doing on the market structure side. It's not working. The CFTC um, doesn't have authority right now to regulate spot digital commodities, mm. though 70% of the industry is considered a commodity if you look at Bitcoin and ETH. And so right now, it, it doesn't work. The enforcement actions are stifling innovation. We've got jobs, potential voters for those members of Congress, potential revenue for those members of Congress that are going overseas. No one wants to see that. And so I'm very optimistic that 2025 politics will then be behind us, hopefully, which I guess we can never really say that in DC, but hopefully the election season will be behind us. Um, we'll start to move legislation and we'll start to rack up some wins. Quick follow-up question on Saab 121. Um, we know th that had been uh, vetoed by Biden, but there's been a lot of rumblings that the SEC is doing something where they're giving a certain preference to maybe certain banks kind of bypassing yeah. the, their own rules? The SEC being secretive uh, and non-transparent to the people. What a shocker. Uh, yeah, we've we've heard this. And I can tell you from my conversations with members of Congress, uh, they are pissed off about this. There has been no transparency to even those members of Congress. I would imagine this is a question that comes up at those oversight hearings. What the heck is going on with SAB 121? You're giving specific carve outs to the biggest banks um, while you're continuing to rail against the crypto industry. That seems like favoritism. That seems unfair. Um, and it doesn't seem to make sense. And so if there's issues with this um, staff accounting bulletin to the point where you have to give carve outs to certain people, doesn't that indicate that we should nullify this and try to start over? Um I am very hopeful that SAB 121 will be nullified soon. I think if you have a Trump administration come in, it's nullified day one. I think um, hopefully under even a Harris uh, administration. But there are other efforts in Congress outside of the resolution, which unfortunately was vetoed, to nullify this. That folks are still working on this. No one has given up on this. There is the Uniform Treatment of Custodial Assets Act, which would effectively nullify SAB 121. That is led by Congressman Flood. Um, and Congressman Nickel, there have been some um, proposals to the appropriations bills to fund the government that would say, hey, SEC, for all the funds that Congress gives you or appropriates to you, you can't use any of those funds to enforce 721, effectively nullifying it. So folks are getting creative, again, with limited legislative time. Can we use one of those must-pass vehicles to try to put in some good crypto policy? That's what's happening now. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that this will be nullified shortly. Yeah, um, man. I, and, you know, Cody, I think I've mentioned this to you before. You know, I, I haven't really paid attention to government before crypto. And maybe yeah. now I'm seeing it. For Do you regret it now? <laughs> in a way. <laughs> but yeah. also, you know, knowledge is power. So it's 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 good to have that. But it's frustrating, yeah. though. To, to see an agency act this way. It's really yeah. uh, it's It's bizarre. I mean, it's just so... Yeah it's the antithesis of their mandate. I mean, their mandate is to protect investors. 
what investors are protected by the open sea wells notice and a p- possible open sea uh, enforcement action especially going after open sea when they're at one of their lowest revenue points and that's not a dig at open sea but the nft marketplace and for digital collectibles has dwindled compared to the heights of 2021 2022 and that bull market and so who are you protecting with this going after them now it seems like they are just trying to um create narratives they're just trying to again show that they're strong on crypto and don't, don't believe that it should exist in our financial markets and it's it, there's there's no good policy rationale for doing this and so it's bizarre i've never really seen an, a regulator act like this hmm. uh cody always great insights my friend thank you so much of course man always good to talk to you tony